Hey, what's going on? Welcome to Angular Air. I'm your host, Justin Schwarzenberger. And on today's episode, we are going to be going over containerizing Angular apps with Docker. Should be pretty cool. We're always excited about Docker, so it'll be great to dive into that. Uh, let's say hi to our panelists, and then we'll meet our guest. Joining us today, we've got Alyssa Neichel. Alyssa, how's it going? Hey, glad to be here. Glad to have you, as always. Uh, Bonnie Brennan is with us. Bonnie, how's it going? It's great. Good to be here. Excited, as always. Awesome, awesome. And our guest today is the one and only Dan Walleen. Dan, how's it going? It's going good. And Justin, I just want to say that you're awesome just because you can say my name 100% right every time. Good job, by the way. Well, well, thank you very much. I mean, when when I did my talk a couple of years ago, and I was gonna, and I was between you and John Papa, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna announce their names. Then I, I was like deathly afraid. So I practiced your name, got it, you know, right. And so now I feel, I feel pretty confident. Surprised how many people I've known for years that can't say it. Anyway, I, I just you know, you remember. remember. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you, actually, you wouldn't be surprised. That's right, because uh, yours isn't exactly that easy to say. So, but anyway, hey, good to be here. So. All right, well, we're great to have you. So for the people that may not know you, why don't you give a little background on yourself and stuff like that? Sure. So uh, yeah, it's, my name's Dan Walleen. Think of a wall leaning, and you got it. The only countries I've been to that say it right are Norway and Sweden, because I guess it's Swedish, so way, way back in the day. But uh, yeah, I run a consulting company called Walling Consulting. Uh, we specialize, we do a lot of training, on-site training for teams, uh, architecture, mentoring, those type of things on uh, Angular, of course, as well as uh, lots of other texts like Node and ASP.NET Core and Docker and Kubernetes and lots of fun stuff. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, I stare at the computer screen too much. That's pretty much the story of my life. <laughs> you can't forget, you know, my first uh, experience with Dan Walleen, I was it was back in 2013, and I was a little consultant uh, off in a corner all by myself, and I learned NG Repeat, which was so cool, and I loved it. And then, uh, so I started using Angular at work and then I quickly got in over my head because when I had to go and make custom directives and all these, I didn't know what I was doing, right? All I knew was ng repeat. And uh, so I was struggling to learn and we didn't have half the resources back then that we had now. And then all of a uh, sudden I found Angular in 60-ish minutes. And I was like, ah, angels sang and a light bulb went off over my head just like the cartoons and it all made sense and I was like, Whoever this Dan Wally, your voice was just very calming, and it was just so simple. It was, what, it's, yeah. I was still saying, like, put you to I sleep. I was on the verge of getting fired, and you and you just made it all click in my brain, and it was. <laughs> well, that's yeah. awesome. I'm I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. Yeah, I was probably the first time you met me. You probably were a little freaked out because I was just like, Dan, I just want to tell you how awesome you are. Thank you so much, and you were like, uh, okay, you're welcome. <laughs> no, nah, I don't remember feeling that way. I just I remember thinking. Excited. He's very enthusiastic. That's awesome. So, well, I have to say thank you again for Angular in sixty-ish minutes. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I never, I never made one for the, the new Angular. Um, I, one of these days, I keep people keep asking, "Are you going to make that?" And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I will one of these days. We'll see. Need more time in the day, right? Right. Yeah. Speaking of resources, Dan provides so much content out there for the Angular community. It's amazing. I mean, you mentioned the the sixty seconds, all the talks you've done, um, all the additional you know um, blog posts you've written. I think you do some Flipboard stuff that you maintain, uh, coursework, all kinds of stuff for us. It's great. Yeah, we we all stay busy, don't we? Which is I always say it's better than being bored. So I mean, you really do have a very good way of explaining things that just take it down to make it because some of the stuff that you do is, you know, it's complicated and uh, you just make it simple. You make it seem very simple. Just take one chunk at a time and explain it. And it's good. You're, you have that talent. Not everybody can do that. Well, thank you. That's because I'm a simple thinker, Bonnie. That's that's all it is, you know. Well, that helps us. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm with you, though. I, I uh I have to first understand it myself, so I'm very visual. I think most people are, not everybody that I meet, but you know, most people are. So if I can't visualize it, I figure, given the amount of training and mentoring type stuff we do, a little bit hard to do my job, you know, unless I can do that, so. Awesome. All right, so Docker, right? I, yeah. Why don't we start with Docker and Angular? Yeah, isn't this Angular Air? Like, why are we talking about Docker, Justin? I yeah I don't I'm wondering the same thing. No, yeah, I mean, good I, question. Does <laughs> Docker and Angular go together like peanut butter and jelly? 
Docker goes with everything. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so Docker is, it really is one of my favorite technologies. Um, I, you know, I love Angular, of course, and spas in general, but if I had to pick like what's my favorite technology over the last five years or so, Docker is only about five years old. Um, I probably would actually say Docker is probably my favorite of all technologies out there um, right now. And the reason is, uh, let me give you a little story on it to help understand for those that maybe haven't done any Docker. So I, many, well, not many, but a few years ago, decided to go with uh, WordPress for my blog. And it was just kind of one of those, you know, hosted type solutions. Um, but I did have the ability with this one. It wasn't the WordPress one. It was a, a different one. But I did have the ability to add my own uh, plugins. And I don't know if you guys have done that with your blogs and whether it's WordPress or another. But, you know, I only had one instance of this thing, which was production. And you know how fun that is. You're like, hey, I want to add this new, like, search, you know, SEO plugin. And you add it, and every now and then it would just crash the whole freaking block. <laughs> and you know, it's like nothing more fun than trying things out in production, right? Which I would never do for my code stuff, but again, this was kind of a hosted solution. And after the first time, you know, I had a way to recover it quick. And um, or after the second time, I mean, I went, okay, this has got to stop. Like, this is insanity. So you know, I looked into you can install WordPress locally, and you know, just I know you've done a lot of PHP over the years, way back in the day, right? Um, yep. And you can get it going locally, but then, you know, you got to have MySQL or MariaDB or whatever they call that and, and blah, blah, blah. So I decided that, well, as I had been doing Docker at that point, that I'm going to containerize my block. Um, so I went ahead and did that. And it was phenomenal because I could run the exact same production version locally I mean, when I say exact, I mean exact. And then I did have to get a VM up in the cloud because um, now I can't use this hosted, you know, WordPress. So that was the kind of the downside. But I had a hundred percent like confidence I could deploy my app and would work as I expected. So that's how I kind of really got excited about Docker, sort of when I first got into it. So for those that are new to it, the concept is imagine instead of just shipping your code over to a server, so Let's say, uh, Bonnie, you're the, the host, right? And uh, you are going to run my code on whatever, Apache, Nginx, whatever it may be. Um, well, you know, the normal way that we're all used to is you, uh, well, hopefully you have an automated solution, a pipeline. But if you don't, and you, you know, at the worst case, FTP your code up, and then you hope everything's the same as when you tested locally, right? And that means my server, my patches, my security. And, you know, as we all know as developers, there's like a gazillion things that can go wrong. You know, the, the, there's a reason we say works on my machine, right? Um, because that's just how it is. So with Docker, what you end up doing is instead of shipping the code to some environment and hoping that the environment has everything set up properly. Now, I will admit with Angular, given that we're shipping, you know, the dist folder, it's a little more straightforward there, but but even with that, you could have security issues, patch issues on the server, uh, all kinds of stuff can come up. So with Docker, what it allows you to do is you build what's called an image, and it's not a VM image though. It's, uh, for instance, Nginx Alpine, which is what I use for my Angular stuff, uh, is around, last I looked, about 18 meg total, like 18 meg, not gig. And so it's not a VM, you know, VMs could be obviously gigabytes in size, Linux or Windows VMs. And so what you do is you make this image and then I could ship it now to you, Bonnie. You can now take that, pull this image from what they call a registry. And then you run this thing called a container. So think of like a ship with the shipping containers, you know, the big rectangular things. Well, when we ship code back and forth, I think of that as kind of like the 1700 ships. So think of, uh, you know, barrels and buckets and, um, well, no containers back then. But, you know, everything was different size. So you, I, I don't know because obviously I didn't live back then. But my guess is 
Uh, Justin, you're killing me with your facial express. I love it, man. <laughs> I know. I'm like, is this metaphor that apt? <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway, Ryan over there. I love Justin's face. Justin's into it. He's into it. Uh, uh, anyway, he's in a boat shaped like a whale for some reason. I don't know. Maybe that's it. <laughs> but you can imagine it would take quite a bit of time to pull off all these different shapes, right? Whereas now, imagine today's ships where you have the big containers and they're all the same size. It's very automated. In fact, I was uh, I was over in Italy in June, and uh, just happened to be sitting in a restaurant that overlooked where they were doing unloading of the docks, and it was amazing how I was just like, man, they have this down to a freaking science. It's just quick, you know. Well, with Docker, it's kind of the same thing. You get this reproducible way to think of the shipping containers. What I send to Bonnie. Bonnie, you now kind of fire up this container, but it has everything. It has the server, it has security, it has uh, the code, it has environment variables. A anything your app needs is in this container. So now I can move it between environments, between clouds, and it just runs. So that's kind of the big overview of what Docker does. Better late than never. <laughs> hey, okay. Austin, what's going on? Hey, so uh, that was an awesome explanation. Um, I think there's like some other things that are really valuable that um, like we often as developers overlook. Um, things like, uh, you know, being able to run these containers on any environment, whether that's Windows box, a Linux box, a Mac, a Mac box, like you can run these same containers on any environment. You don't have to actually change your code. Um, and so that's like really powerful when you're like working with large teams and you know maybe your IT department has like specific Linux images they want to use. There's often Docker containers that or Docker images on the repo on the registry that have those images for you. And so that's like really powerful, I think. Is Another it thing slow is, though? Like uh, is it, you'd like to use them versus running it locally? I mean, you're going to incur some overhead because it's like, I mean, it kind of is a VM under the hood, right? The only time I've really had problems running Docker locally was when the uh, there was a memory leak inside the Docker, but it wasn't actually Docker's fault. It was the code <laughs> running inside Docker just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But yeah, it's it, for me, I think the biggest thing with Docker is it, it just has completely changed onboarding new team members. It's like yeah. it doesn't matter what you know version of Node or all, all those errors that we had to work through for every single new person. Now it's just here, run this, and you're up and running. Yeah, and I, I think that's another good uh, point to bring up. And first off, to address the performance at runtime production, no, there should be no impact um, because what containers do is they actually sit right. I think of it as a layered cake, and an image is nothing more than layers of your chocolate cake. And you're basically taking that cake and then putting it on top of the OS. So you're not making a new OS, you're just putting it right on top. So it's almost like it merges in. And then containers are like, they add a what's called a readable, writable layer, which doesn't really matter, but they're like the frosting on the top of the cake. That's sort of what the container adds. So if you hit, for instance, so for our company, since nobody can spell my name, as we've already discussed, uh, Schwarty, for you, you know, there's a reason a lot of people call you Schwarty. <laughs> For me, they just stick with Dan. But anyway, uh, several years ago, we moved to codewithdan.com um, because nobody could spell Walling Consulting. So if you hit codewithdan.com, that's actually all containers. Um, and I have about eight containers running right now there, maybe 10 now for different things. You know, everything from Redis to Mongo to uh, the WordPress to, is it MariaDB or MariahDB? I think it's MariaDB. Is that how you say it? Anyone know? It's you my have secret. chocolate cake, Dan. I don't know how you do it. But anyway, uh, the performance there, and that's on Linux, and you can do Windows containers or Linux containers. So it just depends. If you're on Windows uh, 2016 or higher, then you can run, well, now you can run both, Linux or Windows. If you're just on, like, I'm on a Ubuntu uh, Linux VM up in Azure, then I'm just... Uh, running natively on that and the performance is phenomenal. Now, if you do run it locally, yeah, there is an extra VM. So if you're on Mac, it uses a uh, hypervisor. 
and it does have a little Alpine little mini uh, VM it runs. And if you're on Windows, uh, it uses Hyper-V and it does that. So yeah, you do have a little bit of overhead when you run locally, but when you go to production, no, it should be you know super oh, fast. So I've only ever used one for local. I actually didn't know you could go to production with your container. I didn't, like had yeah, that thing. that's that's yeah. where, <laughs> as as was mentioned, that's where it gets cool. So I, I think the big benefits are number one, what was just addressed. You can move between environments very easily. I literally, Alyssa could give you my image. Um, in fact, some of them are private, so you can't get to them, but some of them are public up in Docker Hub, or you can move them to Google Cloud or AWS or Azure or whatever. Uh, I'll but wait you till can... after the episode's over, Alyssa. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. No, yeah. do it now. Have so much fun. <laughs> okay. But you could literally pull down uh, my image and get it up and running. Well, it depends on what you're doing, but if it's just one image, you could probably get that up and running, especially an Nginx one, in under, I don't know, two to five seconds, probably. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's that's once you've pulled the image locally, but that shouldn't take long. Long as you're, you know, you're not on the... Uh, you're not on 56k modem, I suspect. So, <laughs> so I understand the idea behind using these like locally, like the benefits there. But I don't understand why you use them in production. Yeah. So think of it this way. Um, and Bonnie, you just kind of nailed it with what you said with bringing up onboarding teams. So let's say that you mentioned Node, Bonnie, but it could be anything, right? It could be PHP, it could be Java, it could be .NET. It doesn't really matter. But let's say that we're on node, what is the latest? 8.11. something. Anyone know? Something I think we'll stick with. <laughs> um, but let's say 8.12 comes out, or or we switch to 10, let's just say. Well, if the developer locally is running, and I, you know, you, you already get that you mentioned, but let's just say you installed load node locally. Now you have to make sure that, of course, you have upgraded everything to uh, 10. And while we can do that, you know, it's a little bit of a pain to get everybody on the same page with the exact same version and all that. Well, now imagine we run containers locally. So now that container has, let's just say 10.0. I, I know it's 10 dot something, but 10.0. Okay, well, that solves that part. Now, the, to answer your question on production or staging, or you know, a lot of people have four environments. They'll have dev, uh, staging, QA, and then production. Just kind of painful if you work in one of those where you have those four lands, but you know, it's safer. So now you could pull that image to staging, you could pull it to QA, you could pull it to production, and the exact same setup that we ran locally could also be run in production. And so there's no surprises now. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Cause there were the last job I had, we did have those four actually. And there was, I remember one bug that we could not reproduce outside of production. And so I got to do some fun, I guess you'd call it live hacking. Cause literally I was like, well, try pushing this up live. <laughs> like, uh, so that, that actually be amazing to never have to do that again. <laughs> so, okay. Live hacking is the best hacking. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other I, things. I, I don't often yeah. test my code, but when I do, I test it in production. That's right. <laughs> production so is the only here. way to test. <laughs> One of the other benefits, too, of that is that with those containers in your production, you can uh, fire up multiple of those rapidly and quickly. So you can scale right as your um, party like gets bigger. For, you can make more cakes right away. And, and You're talking about like your, if there's people hitting your site? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another thing. Scale out. Scale Another up. thing, I'm Mr. Cybersecurity Guy here. Another thing is uh, when you're deploying like, you know, more than a WordPress site, <laughs> um, like, you know, typically you have IT teams that are like managing these instances, right? And personally, I don't want to be responsible for configuring the security on a Linux box in production. So the yeah. cool thing is, the cool thing is like they can configure it and they can manage that whole layer there. And then basically like you can say, here's my image. And this just kind of lays on top, like a, like a nice layer of ice cream in your chocolate cake. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm making myself hungry now. Right. <laughs> I know we started with, you know, we started with boats and then I'm like, man, I want to get on the open seas. Then we went to cake and now I'm super hungry, but now you're ready for a cruise. Right? 
Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> One of the things I find interesting about Docker, and you talk about like why you want to use it and stuff like that, it almost feels like at first it's this solution to this problem that we have, right? This the version control, the, the scenarios we get in, the onboarding of other developers, um, those sort of things. So it begins with it's awesome because it solves these problems that we hit. And now all of a sudden we, we feel better. But then as we start using it, we start revealing like these features and things that we can start using and getting even more excited about, right? I think we would talk about the fact that like, okay, now we've isolated our and made it easy to go to different environments. You know, now you throw in the mix and you say, well, I've got a continuous integration server or, or um, that process that I need to add into this thing to run my tests and stuff. Well, now I, I've got the same kind of container. I can slide that thing up into there. Now I can have this whole workflow and, and all these other things start revealing themselves as now this added stuff that we can do with Docker that we get even more excited about, right? Yeah, and that's really the key is the ability to bring up an environment. Now, an environment could be something as simple as a server, but it also could be more realistic, like microservices would be a maybe a better example where you have quite a bit, you know, Angular calling into a API gateway, which then can call, you know, who knows what behind the scenes. Um, that's where it really, really shines because, you know, think, well, I'll give you an example. There's a company here in, I'm in Arizona, so in Scottsdale, they, uh, I think they had about 25 microservices. And uh, it was to the point, though, where it was kind of hard to bring up that environment locally because, you know, now you're eating the, each, each container does have a server running. So at some point you have memory issues <laughs> on a laptop. Okay. But um, they were able to literally simulate their entire environment locally, you know, on, on a beefier machine um, and do the development against that to try to isolate problems. Or you just mentioned another use, Justin, which is testing. Uh, think about end-to-end -end testing where it's not just like Protractor with Angular or I use Cypress. That's my preference for Angular. But um, you also want to bring up the maybe even the databases. Uh, some people even containerize their databases. I do. Not everybody does, and you don't have to. But I all my stuff in production is containerized, including the databases. Well, I can bring up that entire environment, run a whole suite of tests, and then dump it, and I'm done. And then if I want to do it again, bring it back up. And you know, try doing that with VMs. And uh, let's just say I'll, I'll race you. <laughs> you do it with VMs, and I'll do it with containers. And Another thing. Like the, you, sorry, let me go real quick. You, you think about like the deep, little details in there, too. Like when you're testing, and you're, you're testing that end-to-end -end type of stuff, you're submitting data and changing data in your database. Exactly. And so each run, you need to reset your database. And this makes it really easy to do that. Exactly. Another thing there is um, who likes configuring databases and like Nginx and things like that? Like, yeah, everyone, right? So, I mean, we talked about it briefly, like the registry, right? Like you can get, there's probably an Angular Docker image that you can just pull and you don't have to do anything. Now, let me say you should be very careful when you're pulling other people's images that are not official images. Absolutely. Um, but it is kind of like pre-configured. Um, why? You know, is there dangerous? Setups. Are these dangerous images? Are we worried about the? Why are we? You could if you download a Docker image from someone that you don't know and just run it on your. I, yeah, you don't want to do that. It, it'd be like any cloning any project, really. And just running it without looking into who's behind it. And it's the same thing could happen, you know? Yeah. All kinds of crazy stuff could happen. So yeah, it's not, it's not Docker per se. It's just that, as was mentioned, uh, and we'll talk about some Docker files here in a minute, but, you know, who knows? They could put in some hacky stuff that deletes some certain folders, for example. It's the um, Trojan Docker. Yeah. It's like anything. You just got to be responsible. Hey, there's a quick question on the chat, uh, and and I think I know what I what my answer would be, but you're the pro. So, uh, should they use ideally one con one container per app, or can you put multiple apps in one container? Like, if you know you're going to have multiple apps running together and interacting with each other, what would be the best way to structure that? Yeah, and no, that's an excellent question. That comes up all the time, actually. Um, when I especially I'll go into companies and we'll talk with them that are new to Docker, and that question always comes up. Um, so the best practice is every app and even every part of the app should have its own container. 
You want to think of uh, containers as they're almost like little Tupperware containers, but they're like disposable ones so that when you're done with that, I don't know, you ate whatever's in there. Uh, it's let's say it's plant degradable type, you know, container and you just throw it away. Right. Um, that's kind of how containers work. So while you could put as an example, let's say you had uh, Nginx serving up your static files. That's what I use. Uh, very, very good, super fast, awesome server. And then let's say that it forwards dynamic requests like API requests uh, to your you know, GraphQL or REST APIs or whatever to Node or ASP.NET Core or PHP or whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You could put those both in the same. It would be possible to do that. Um, that would definitely not be recommended. And here's why. When you now go to make a change to the API, you end up having to ship the whole image for not only the API, but also the Nginx. And so number one, the size is gonna get bigger, of course. Uh, but number two, now you can't independently deploy things. So by using uh, the, kind of the rule of single responsibility that we do in code, apply that to containers as well. And now you can independently, independently deploy. And I'll give you an example. Just last night, I did an update to this codewithdan.com site. And I'm able to just deploy, in that case, it's a node container for that piece. I didn't have to redeploy Nginx or any of the database containers or any of the you know, Redis or anything else. It was all separate. So it keeps things smaller. And it's much easier also to version um, independent parts of your app that way. So can you give us like a stopping point, though, for breaking it down? Like there's got to be like too small, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> it, it's kind of like, you know how uh, serverless is kind of a big thing nowadays, right, as well? And you just have like functions. And you literally could just host a function, you know, in a serverless cloud, um, you know, whether it's Lambda or Azure Functions or whatever. So it now I, I do agree with you, Alyssa. I, I think people sometimes take, well, it'd be like components in Angular going, you know, every time I do a BR tag, I'm actually going to make a component for that. You know what I mean? I mean, you can right. go a little over. Some people right. have done this. You joke, but some yeah. people have done this. I, I call it in the Microsoft world back in the old days, we used to call it DLL hell. Well, I, I would call that component hell. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I would agree that you don't want to go so granular that you've now, uh, what do we call it? A distributed, they, they call that a distributed monolith. In other words, we were trying to be, you know, independently deploying things and being very granular. But in essence, you just made more of a nightmare than you would have had if you just would have put all in one container. So it's, it's kind of a balancing scale. Um, normally, I would break it down just to the app itself, like the Angular app. We can talk more about that in a bit. Uh, and then each API, if you want to go microservice, each microservice would have its own container or you might just have a RESTful service and it's in one container. Uh, it just really depends on what your company's doing. I will say this, the more containers you have, you better have a good way to monitor your containers and you better have a good way to run them. Now we're looking at something called Kubernetes and that's another topic for another show. <laughs> so speaking of showing us some stuff, uh, cause we're about halfway through the show. Cool. Can you, can, because, I mean, for me, when I'm trying to learn something or I, like I hear about something new that I haven't actually had a chance to play with yet. And I always get kind of intimidated, like, oh, that's another thing I have to learn. But the first time I ever tried Docker, I was actually pretty pleasantly surprised. I mean, it was really, it's not that complicated. Uh, it's a cool thing to use, but it's not like a whole nother language that you have to learn. It's just a little bit of configuration. Can you can you show us? Yeah, sure. So, uh, Justin, you said to tell you. I'm telling you. <laughs> You're sharing. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to share this screen. I'm ready. All right, there we go. Um, so this is a really simple little Angular project that I could just do an ng serve on, actually. Um, it's a very basic customer order, super simple one. Uh, but it's it's one I use in, uh, I have a new Pluralsight course as a quick shameless plug uh, called Containerizing uh, Angular Applications with Docker. And before I show you this, let, let's first, I think one question that comes up a lot is, hey, you know, Dan, when I build, you know, you get your dist folder that we're all used to, right? And, you know, I have all my stuff in here. 
why would I need a container for that? And I, I think that's actually a valid question to ask for, you know, whether it's Angular or React or Vue or any front end technology. And my thing would be if your company is doing a public facing site and uh, you're looking at the optimal performance, you know, you want regional distribution like Australia, China, US, whatever, you know, a CDN is always a good way to look at, it, in my opinion. Um, for this type of stuff because I mean it's static files once we do an ng build of course Okay, but not every company uh, is doing something public first off Second off not every company is invested in a CDN a content delivery network if you're new to that so Where containers come in is let's just say for now that whether it's public or not you want a hundred percent control over it so you want to have a server that you can easily deploy between environments that has your Angular code in it. Well, containers are great for this because what I'm going to show you is this is, a again, just a normal, um, you know, ng new project, nothing real special. Um, but you'll notice I have some Docker files in here for Nginx. Now I'm going to open up this really simple one. This is like as simple as you could possibly get right here. And then I have some comments. In fact, let me uh, real quick so that everybody, if anybody wants to play with this, and Justin, let me know if you're able to. Okay, can you see that? Yep. A browser. That. Okay, so if you go to um, github.com slash Dan Walling, it is called Angular Core, or uh, yeah, Angular Core Concepts. Where is he? There it is, right there. So here's the actual link. If, if you guys can see that in the browser, it might be a little small in, in this resolution, but this is the project. Right so if you guys want to. So you spell Waleen correctly W A H L I N. Thank you, Bonnie. Yes. Yeah. You and Justin are both on my good list now. <laughs> <laughs> Woo you know, the funny thing is, my wife's name's Haiti, but it's it's spelled H E E D Y. So it sounds like Haiti. So she gets Haiti Whalen, and now she's just like, yeah, that's me. You know, she, she gave up. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is the project. So let me go back to VS Code here. And is uh, is dark okay? Coming across okay for you guys? Yeah. Dark background? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes it doesn't come across good on video. But so this is uh, what's called a Docker file. Now, remember I said Docker really makes two things. You have, First, you have to build these things called images. And I'm using an image called Nginx Alpine. Alpine's a really small, if you're not familiar with that, Linux variant. It's like, I don't know, Alpine's probably about four meg or something like that, four to six meg. Nginx Alpine's about 18 meg, last I looked. Um, we can actually, in fact, I should have kept my browser up there. Let me bring that back, hold on. All right, so let's go to hub.docker.com and let me zoom in. Uh, Justin, tell me if... Uh, is that too much? No, I think that looks good. Good, okay, I'm gonna go one out. So these are some of my private repos here and, and some public ones, but if I go search for just Nginx, um, we talked about the official. Official is always better <laughs> because these are officially from like the company or the open source group that works on that. So we'll go to Nginx here, and then you'll notice there's several different kind of variations and versions and things. So, you know, 115.3 down to 114.0. Now, there's also this thing called latest. Now, latest, um, you got to be careful um, because latest, it's kind of like always grabbing the latest version of Angular if you were doing um, ng build or N M npm installs. You, know, you got to be not so much with Angular, but maybe you have other dependencies. And you got to be really careful to make sure those dependencies are backward compatible, right? Which is why we have the package lock and all that, or yarn, you know, lock. Um, well, same thing with Docker images. They have what's called the latest, which is like you're always grabbing the latest, but just be careful. I'm going to show you latest just to keep it simple, but we should be careful of that. So anyway, they'll have a little walkthrough and kind of how to get started down here. Here's how we can get it to my machine. So if I were to do this, I could use one of these variations. You'll see there's Alpine right there. Or I could do 115.3 Alpine. So if I go on back, I could do a Docker pull Nginx and then it'd be colon Alpine, or I could do 115.3 Alpine, something like that. But I'll just do the latest here. 
right? And if I do this, first off, you'd have to have Docker uh, desktop installed. So you'll notice I have a little whale icon up here. This is free. Uh, you can get it on Windows and on Mac. And then, of course, do Docker kind of runs natively on Linux, although so you'd have to install Docker. Um, but I can do a Docker pull. Now, I don't know if I have the latest of this or not, but if not, it'll grab. Okay, so you'll notice it did a little bit. Um, it says already exists. That layer of the cake I already had, whereas these were slightly updated. But you notice how fast that was. Now, granted, I'm on a gigabit network right now, so it's fast, but it's still pretty small overall. So now to show you this image, this is the cake, if you will, um, of just Nginx. Let me clear that. We'll do Docker images. And let's see here. I'll have to find. These are all my local versions that ultimately go to production. But somewhere in here, we will have, there it is, Nginx Alpine right there. Yeah, 18.6 meg. It's actually gone up slightly since last I looked, but very small. So that is kind of the, the first thing is that there is an Nginx server image already out there. And then what we would need to do is take that and add layers on top of the cake. And the layers we would want to add would be things like the disk folder and then also possibly some configuration for Nginx because, you know, you guys know that if you move Angular to any server, your routing has to be kind of forwarded back so the server doesn't air. You know, because if you go to localhost or whatever your server is slash customers, if the server thinks customers is a route, of course, it's going to do a 404. So we need to make sure it just kind of passes that back to the, you know, index HTML. So that's what this config file is doing right here. I won't have time to go into that, but that's just an Nginx, uh, oops, config thing. So I have this uh, Nginx Alpine now. Now what I'm going to do is make a custom image. Now this one is just local. And it would be used for, I want to run Nginx, but I want to link back to my local code. So in other words, at this point, I'm not copying my code into the container. I'm just using Nginx to kind of test things for real um, instead of just using ng-serve as an example. Now, by the way, on that topic, that also comes up a lot. Do I still use ng-serve? Absolutely. Anytime I can use ng-serve locally, I will use ng-serve. But um, in cases where I am kind of ready to say, hey, let's do things for real, then I'll say, all right, well, let's try out whether it's Apache or Nginx or whatever you, IIS, whatever you use. So I you'll notice this is really simple. I say from Nginx Alpine, that's the layer of the cake. I'm going to add a new layer, who to blame. Okay, that's me. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to copy in a local config file. And really all this config file does is make sure that Nginx doesn't try to go to my routes, my Angular routes. It just lets them run like we're used to on the client side, um, just like you guys have had to do on different servers. And then I'm copying that into an Nginx folder um, that's going to be part of this image here that's part of Nginx. Now, I would then need to build it. I'm not going to have time to go through all this because we're already at, we got about 15 minutes, right? right. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I can do everything in 15 minutes, but we could build this into an image and run it. But when I run it, I can do this thing called a volume. Now what this is going to do is I'm linking in this $PWD here. That's my current working directory. Now that would be this project where this Docker file is here. And then the disk folder, of course, would be the disk. And you'll notice I, if you've used the newest Angular JSON, it usually puts your uh, project as a subfolder. Well, in this project, I flattened it out to just because I only have one app. Um, so here's kind of my build. So what I would do then is say, hey, I want to run this in the container, but I don't want to copy the code in the container because if I do that, every time I change the code, I'd have to stop the container, rebuild the image restart the container, and it would be very painful. So we're going to create something called a volume. And what that does is when I say Docker run, that'll start up this Nginx container. It's going to expose port 8080 externally, Nginx 80 internally. I think of it as if you think of a shipping container, uh, inside of the container, if you open up the big door, it's 8080, or sorry, 80 in there. But imagine there's a telephone on the outside that you pick it up, and that's 8080. And that forwards through the line to 80 inside of the container. That's what's happening. 
Now, this dash V means set up a volume to, and what this is going to do is this is in the container, but this is like poking a hole in that shipping container and, I don't know, putting a hose in there or something. And the hose comes out and it points to something outside of the container, a bucket, let's say. Well, that's this code. And then this would be the image um, I would have built that's this guy. All right. So basically, in fact, eh, I can probably run this pretty quick. We could we can just paste this down here. This would do a build and create this Nginx Angular. Um, it's going to use this file called Nginx Docker file. And the dot here means it's relative to where this Docker file is. That's what the build does. So let me go ahead and do that. It's super fast. Now, I just built an image there. And if I did Docker images, I could then show you that image. Now, the next thing would be, well, how do I link it to my local code and run it with Nginx? Now, here's the cool thing. How many know Nginx well? Now, maybe some of you do. Um, I'm proficient, but I won't say it's my expertise. I am very good at finding good config files that are considered solid and copying and pasting and tweaking. That's my specialty. Um, I think we're all good at that, right? For sure. So, now I'm going to say, all right, well, let's run this container, but let's point to my dist folder. But what the container is going to do is it thinks this folder here, this HTML folder, is actually where the code is. So it, locally, it's going to look in this local folder, which then forwards the request only for development purposes in, in this case to here. So we'll fire this up. Now, I didn't do a dash D here. Dash D means detach. So notice it locked up my console. Okay, and that's because I didn't say give me back my console. So now we can come back to here and sorry, this is probably a little. Um, all right, and there we go. Now I don't have, I don't know why I don't have customers. Well, anyway, I'll have to look into why that is as I'm expecting customers there, but this would be a, a very sophisticated app. You can see <laughs> it's very simple. Um, but that would be an example of actually uh, running the container. Hold on, let me dump my cache. I am expecting something to uh, happen there. Oh, I might need a rebuild. Yeah, I might need a rebuild, but that's okay. My ng build, I probably just need to redo it. Um, but that would be an example of actually running the container. Now, notice what happened. Here's the logs that happened as it called into Nginx. So now I'm going to control C. And then if I do docker ps-a, it says that the container exited about three seconds ago. And you'll notice there's a container ID. So then I'm going to say docker remove. And let's remove 615. And it's gone. Let me just clear this. Now we'll do docker ps-a, and no containers are running. So it's as if it never existed. Pretty cool. All right, any, uh, I'm going to let you guys chime in. Any, any comments so far before I move to the next stage here? This is so cool. That's all I want to hear. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, that's, you know, checks in the mail there, Bonnie. <laughs> so then because you've, you've mounted that volume and you pointed that to your disk directory, if you were to do another ng build locally to rebuild that code, then yep. you could refresh that page and see those changes. Exactly. Okay but it would be running in Nginx. Right. Um, another, thing, another thing it for, for people that, you know, don't like the command line, there's some people out there like that. There, there's also a lot of different tools. Um, oh, am I skipping ahead, Dan? No, no, go, just keep going, keep going. No, I, I didn't plan to cover that, so I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, there's a lot of different tools. Docker comes with its own, um, like, Docker UI uh, type thing. Um, that you can open up. Um, and then uh, VS Code, like you're, you're showing here, has a Docker Explorer. There's also a really cool tool that I found the other day called DocStation. And um, it's actually, uh, like, it can, like, group your containers together and, like, um, it, it adds analytics on top of that and things like that, on top of, like, your Docker images and things like that. So there's a lot of really cool tools. Um, you know, if you're... Uh, you know, not comfortable with the command line or, you know, just want some type of visual experience uh, out there. Absolutely. No, I think it's a great point. Yeah, this uh, this tool here is a free extension. Now, I just ran a Docker prune because I see all these none, 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 none. These are called intermediate uh, images. And so, see how they're kind of disappearing now? 
that's what my prune's doing is getting rid of some of the junk I don't need. It'll probably free up a couple of gig here, actually. Um, but yeah, there's some really good tools. My, my favorite one is right here, though, in, in uh, VS Code. I can right click here and like run this container without really knowing command line. Now, it won't do volumes and stuff like that. So you'd have to type that. So those that do know the command line, job security. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you don't technically have to. Now, come on back. Usually it doesn't take that long. It, hopefully it's almost done here. It looks like it is. So yeah, this is, uh, if you go to the extensions, this is just one provided by Microsoft. It's don't let the version scare you. Uh, it is awesome. It works really, really well if you're doing Docker at all. And you get some code help. So these Docker files, um, you'll notice I get the syntax highlighted and stuff. That's part of the extension as well. So yeah, excellent point. So, all right, well, let me show you the kind of the next stage here. So this is great for local, but, you know, for production, I, I don't think you're going to link from some, you know, a cloud server or your production data center back to your local machine. So what do you do then? Well, once you're ready for a real, like, production thing, and Alyssa, this goes back to what you were talking about, and I love the ears, by the way, on the, the picture there. <laughs> I just saw her picture <laughs> pop up. Thanks. Those are awesome. <laughs> we're, we're big Disney fans in my household, so. <laughs> um, the uh, next stage would be, okay, well, how do I build a cake that actually has everything I need in it so that now I can ship it to you or to Bonnie or whoever, and you guys can now pull this down from a registry and run it. All right. When well, this would be my kind of production Docker file. Now this one's a little, oh, look at that. See, I cleaned up four gig right there by doing that prune. Cause I've been doing a ton of builds lately. So that's why it was so much. Um, but if, uh, if I go into this file now, this is called a multi-stage Docker file. And this is cool because what we're doing is actually automating our angular build process and then copying the code out in a second stage from the dist folder into this nginx Alpine. So stage one here of this file. And if you're new to this, don't be too worried about this stuff because it's like anything, it's just a little practice. It's pretty simple once you get it. But in this case, I'm grabbing a node, you know, latest image, 8.11. whatever. Uh, so who do I blame? <laughs> uh, and then I'm setting a work directory. Now, this can be anything you want, but this is a folder I made in that's going to be in this stage one container. So think of a container that all it does in life is build the code. That's it. Now, I'm going to copy in my package JSON, do my npm install. Uh, because my work directory is already set up, this is the equivalent of copy everything. That's what dot means. And this dot is really slash app right there. But I don't have to duplicate that. And then I'm going to do my npm run build, which of course runs our ng build. A uh, little escape I'm doing here so that I can run dash dash prod. Right? So we're getting the AOT going. So this would be like my prod build. Now what that's going to do is as we build, we're going to have this app folder. And the app folder, of course, will have the dist folder inside of it. Now that's gonna be in a container that's gonna be behind the scenes, stage one. Stage two, here's my production runtime container. And what I'm gonna do is, there's a little bit here I'm gonna skip, but I'm gonna say from my node stage one container, okay, and that's this alias I gave it right here, from node, copy the dist folder into where Nginx looks for code. Now, what this will do is actually copy everything in. It'll do the build, copy it all in, copy in some configuration. And then this final image it makes, this is what I'll push up to a registry so that Bonnie or Alyssa or whoever, you guys could pull it down and run it locally. Um, and so we could literally come on in and this, this one will take, just to kind of show you, we'll let it run and then we could just talk here. This one will take a little longer because now it has to do the uh, ng build. But you'll kind of see behind the scenes, notice npm installs running. That's going to install all our normal stuff for the build. And then a little later, you'll see the webpack kicks in um, and does all that. So we'll let that kind of run in the background because that might take a minute or two. So what's really Back to you, Justin. Stage <laughs> one, right, is that, that that's real similar to our own local environment. Like say yeah. we've got a new machine, right? Now we got a setup. We want to start working on our code. Well, what do we got to do? We got to install Node, right? And then we can bring down our code and start doing the Angular thing with the npm run build and, and stuff like that, right? Yep. 
Um, and so now what you've done is you've containerized that so that it's almost like another machine that can run that. But now we have the ability to say, hey, we can specify that node version in that stage one to make sure that everybody who builds this thing that goes through the pipeline is going to be built in the same environment all the way down to node, right? Exactly. Because I'm on my machine and I have node 8.2 and you know, Alyssa's on hers and she has 8.0. Seven, if that's even really a thing, I don't know. And and she decides she's the one that has to build it, and it works fine. And I go and I build it, and I deploy, and mine hoses it. Like what heck happened there, right? And this yep. provides a solution for that. That's exactly that's exactly right. Oh, I realized why my data didn't come up because I have another container for the API. Duh. <laughs> anyway, it just dawned on me why the the data didn't come up. But anyway. Um, that's exactly right. So if you have a CI CD process, as an example, you could automate this whole process through um, containers. And now we're going to have this really predictable way. So now when I run this, I know everybody built their code. Well, nobody built it locally. You know, they just checked it in. And then the CI CD process would automate this. And now um, we should be able to come in and just start this uh, container here. And I think this one, I actually have another one. That's why I have a Docker Compose, which is a separate topic. But hopefully, we should at least be able to see. Um, let me just pull it up again. What did I say? 8080? Uh, yeah, 8080. So let's run back to that. And it should be the exact same screen. But this time, the, the code is actually, OK, never mind. This time, I copied it in, it looks like. And so, you know, now I have this really sophisticated UI. Woohoo! But that's actually running in Nginx. The code is part of the cake now. Um, and so, you guys actually, right now, this is up um, with just, well, here, I can show you. If I did this, Docker push, Dan Wallin is my alias for Docker. And if I pushed up Nginx Angular like this, let me do a different one because I think I might have one of those up. Let's do. Uh, Let's see, we're on Angular Air. Uh, yeah, sure, we'll just call it that, Engine X. There we go. So now I could push this image. Um, well, that's not what it's called, sorry. I would have to tag it. So the way this would work, I would have to do it when I do a, a, a build I can tag. Let me show you guys a little trick going back to the tools though. I know we're running low on time here. Sorry, I I, I, uh, I like this stuff if you didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did you. So here's uh, this guy. If I right click, I can say tag image. And now what I can say is um, I'm gonna tag it as Dan Wallin, Angular, let's just call it Angular Air, that's good enough. And uh, hit enter there. Now notice it just re-tagged it. All right, now I can say Docker push Dan Wallin slash angular dash air. And now this is gonna go up to my public registry. And then you guys should be able to run it as simple as uh, this command right here, but you would say Dan Wallin angular air, basically. Um, and so now you would say, you know, Docker pull, Error, which I already have, you would do that. And then you would do Docker run and you could give it a port just like we did up above, but substitute Dan Wallin slash Angular dash air if you had Docker desktop installed. And now you would run the app and we could run that. And this gets back to what Alyssa asked earlier. We could run that anywhere um, that we wanted. And again, it's really cool because like now we're getting even more exciting stuff, right? Like I, we've got a team that, that has to be the ones that do quality assurance or they want to preview the app and see what the state of it is currently, right? Oh, yep. well, they can kind of do that without having to have some dedicated environment to do that. So we can start solving all these other additional, you know, benefits that we get out of it because we have this environment set up. Exactly, exactly. And I'm gonna, I don't know if it matters, Just I'm gonna stop sharing here, so we'll... Uh since I know we're out of time. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So yeah, solves a lot of problems. And you really just scratched the surface. You didn't even really go into like, you know, Docker Compose and, you know, you know how it, you know, orchestrating deployment and, and how easy that type of stuff is. Uh, it's exactly. a really powerful, it's such a powerful tool. And um, it's really awesome to see it 
gaining popularity like it is. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Once you have to have what I call the light bulb moment, and once it clicks, you go, "Oh my gosh!" Like this changes everything. Uh, honestly, I will not probably ever deploy code to a server if I unless a client requires it um, ever again uh, because well, I mean, it just solves all these problems. Even then, when you're deploying code to you know a customer instance, right? Like it's kind of if they've got a Docker cluster, it's kind of just like you're deploying it out in Azure or AWS or whatever it is. They can just pull those images, right? Like it's not like you have to like do a bunch of crazy setup for them. Exactly. Um, and, you know, and there is a little more to the story. Like like you said, we really scratched the surface here. Um, you know, for those that are interested, another shameless plug. So I have another course on Pluralsight called Docker for Web Developers. And if you really want an in-depth look at what you can do, then go check out that because that's like six hours or something. Um, it, it's fairly long, but there's a lot you can do, as mentioned. Um, we can orchestrate, bringing up, that's bringing up multiple containers. Um, but the big thing is, that's great for us as developers, but what do you do once you go to production in that world? Like if you have microservices, so you have Angular, and then maybe all these microservices and other stuff. And that's really where Kubernetes has kind of won the battle there. There are other options, but if you go look at Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, or even local stuff companies are doing, a lot of companies are moving to Kubernetes. Um, now there is others, uh, you know, if you're in more of the Microsoft world, there's like Service Fabric, although it can run Linux containers and stuff. And there's other options there, but Kubernetes definitely gets all the press these days. And that's kind of your runtime, scale out, self heal. If a container goes down, how do you know? How do you bring up a new one? Those type of things. Thing. Cool. Uh, on that that six hour plural site course is six <laughs> hours, but it's broken down into many chapters and it's about five to seven minutes usually. Is that right, Dan? So there's yeah, a table of contents like and you can expand the table of contents and go specifically to the topic that you're looking. You don't have to watch the whole six hours. No. You can, no. But it's really great how they break it down into small. I mean, if you can't commit, Bonnie, what are you doing? <laughs> well, no, because I would watch the whole six hours, but then later I want to go back and quick, quickly reference one specific thing, and it's very easy to do. Sort of Ooh, that was a nice save. I like that. That was yeah. good. Yeah. Thanks, Alyssa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I will say, I mean, it, it's getting pretty popular these days, but if you haven't looked in, for those that are checking this out, um, it's, it's definitely worth your time, in my opinion. I know, Justin, you've been at places that use it a ton, and I don't know if you guys do now, but... I know you did, so uh, it's a big Docker. deal. Yeah, the same way, like Docker's like part of the pipeline now. It, it's it's in there, even if I'm doing like a solo project or whatnot. I mean, because for the CI layer and everything like that, it just sets. I, I feel it feels like it's the foundation that sets you up for being able to tackle all these things that come up really easily. Right? You just can't yeah. go back once you get used to using it. I felt the same way about Webpack because the, the first time I used Webpack, I was just like, oh, this is so confusing and caused a lot of bugs. But then I got used to it and then I moved to a new project and they wanted me to like type in all my scripts. I was like, no, we have to bundle them. We can't go back. And it's kind of like that with Docker. Like once you've used it a few times, then you have to try and do it without using Docker. You're not going to want to do that. It's just too convenient. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's a learning curve, but I think uh, it's one of those, I always say it's like, you know, you push the rock uphill for a while and you're like, oh, I'm tired. But then once you get to the top, boy, the, that rock just rolls down real nice. <laughs> well, yeah, but if you have Pluralsight, you just six hours, you're done. You're up and running. <laughs> I, I do. If, for those that are interested that maybe don't have Pluralsight, um, you can also get to all the code from that up on my GitHub repo. So feel free. I have tons of projects on Docker up on uh, github.com slash Dan Walleen as well. So check that out if you just want to get some code and play with it. You're such a wonderful person, Dan. Oh, thank you, Bonnie. You're uh, bigger checks in the mail now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's very it's positive. I love it. Nice. All right. Well, let's get to some picks if anybody has any picks. Uh, Austin's got his hand up. Go for it. So on the Docker theme, um, DocStation, I think it's DocStation.io. I think I've mentioned this before, uh, but since we're talking about Docker, 
you totally have to check this out. Like it's a really cool tool uh, for like managing your Docker. It's a visual interface. It provides like uh, charts and stuff around like performance. Really cool. Another thing um, is GitHub and VS Code uh, launched a plugin for doing pull requests. So literally, VS Code has gotten so awesome, you don't even have to leave VS Code anymore. Um, it is just, if it just had more emojis, I mean, it would just be the best thing ever. All right, that's a good pick. I think your check's in the mail too, so. <laughs> <laughs> but my check's bigger than yours. Oh, <laughs> All right, who, who else? Anybody else have picks? Uh, mine kind of goes along with Austin's and it's maybe perhaps silly, but uh, I've just been really enjoying stack blitz lately. And I, I know like we've had them on the show and um, met the, the two guys that were primarily responsible for creating stack blitz in person. And they're, I mean, it's just, they're amazing and their product is amazing. So I just wanted to give them a shout out because I agree. I mean, even going through the Angular docs and now having the stack blitz side by side with the docs has just been really powerful. And I'm really grateful for that tool. So awesome. That's a good pick. I have yeah. two very quick ones. Uh, one, Sarun uh, on the YouTube chat wants us to add Angular Fire to the list, which is also uh, wonderful. And Justin, I need your help for my pick because I'm really excited about Friday's show, but I'm uh, it's not my show. So can you tell us? Ooh, yeah, we got a bonus episode this week. Um, Yuri Shaked is going to join us and talk about Angular Ivy. So he wrote, we I'm mentioned, so I think, excited. on a previous episode an article right. he wrote. Uh, so he's going to be on here and, and dive deeper into that. So that should be pretty cool. So that's a bonus episode this week on Friday. I think it's at 1 p.m. Pacific time. So, but yes. That's my pick. So see, I could be excited about it and not ruin the, the surprise. I know. I just gave it away. Well, the website hat. No, but that's <laughs> good because they didn't know to come back here on Friday. So now they know to come on Friday and see Uri, which I love Uri and I love Ivy. So I'm super excited about that. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Dan, you have anything you want to pick? You don't have to. Uh, don't feel pressured. I mean, you do. Uh, no, I'll, uh, so, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go with the theme, I guess. So um, I, if you are in Azure, um, which is where my stuff is, um, they just announced yesterday, it's called Azure DevOps. So it's a brand new uh, kind of free pipelines for you can hook into GitHub, you can hook into external stuff. And if you want to get, I think you can do up to 10 parallel processes, like build processes and stuff for free. And you can totally get, like everything's free on it, on the, the DevOps. Um, you know, the only time you start paying is when you have bigger teams and stuff. And when you use the VMs, of course. But like if you need a CI CD process or a build pipeline or something like that, you can totally do it for free. And I just walked through it yesterday because it used to be VSTS. And now they have this whole new um, Azure DevOps, it's called. And I just have played with it because it just came out yesterday officially, but it's pretty cool. Um, and you can get up and running like super fast with a build pipeline and stuff like that. And it'll even support uh, taking those images and containers and running them and hook him into what's called AKS, which is your Kubernetes service for Azure. And so there's some pretty powerful stuff there. And, and all of that is free and you know until you start using the VMs and then you got to pay for that. That sounds pretty awesome. It's it looks really cool though. And I, I don't work for Microsoft by the way. I just like that kind of stuff. So that's why I mentioned it. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well Dan, first off, thank you so much for all the time you put into sharing all the great content that uh, helps our community and helps us develop Angular in so many different ways. Really appreciate that. And super appreciate you taking the time today to share this episode with us and share the content and get us educated. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate all the, the discussions. And uh, yeah, everybody that's looking into Docker, have fun with it. Awesome. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. Catch you Friday. Later. <laughs>